I've got another great mushroom recipe for you, a rich and creamy foolproof mushroom risotto. I'm using king blue mushrooms for this, which is a hybrid between the blue oyster and king oyster. It's similar to an oyster mushroom, but has a nice tender stem that's not going to be chewy like the oyster mushroom. Trim off the bottom stem area. Cut the mushrooms into half inch or so pieces, then add four tablespoons of unsalted butter and four tablespoons of olive oil to a deep pan or Dutch oven over medium high heat. When the butter is melted, add the mushrooms. Season with salt and pepper and cook until the mushrooms have given up their moisture and browned nicely. Add one diced yellow onion, one diced shallot, and two cloves of garlic minced. Cook while stirring frequently until the onion and shallot are softened. Then add one and a half cups of arborio rice. Stir for three to four minutes until the rice becomes translucent around the edges. You don't want to brown it. Stir in two teaspoons of soy sauce, then three quarters of a cup of a dry white wine. Continue to stir until the wine is almost all evaporated and the alcohol smell has cooked off. Then add three cups of chicken stock along with a large pinch of salt, unless your stock is pretty salty. Stir the rice and make sure all the grains are under the liquid, then cover and reduce heat to low. After 10 minutes, give it a stir, then cover again and let it cook for another five minutes or until the liquid is mostly absorbed and the rice is tender with a bit of a bite, basically al dente. Add another cup of chicken stock, increase heat to high and cook while stirring constantly until the rice becomes thick and creamy. Add more stock or water if the risotto becomes too thick and dry. This method isn't traditional, but it allows you to enjoy luxurious risotto without spending the whole evening stirring it. Remove from the heat and add one ounce of freshly grated Parmigiano Reggiano. Stir rapidly to incorporate the cheese, then fold in a quarter cup of heavy cream. Season with salt if needed, then stir in two tablespoons of freshly minced parsley. Paying attention to the meals that Jesus eats in the Gospels can shed light not only on how we should approach eating, but also the Christian life more broadly. In Luke 14, Jesus attends a meal at the home of a leader of the Pharisees on the Sabbath. And throughout the meal, he challenges several societal conventions and paints a picture of a different way of eating and being in community. First, a man with dropsy is present. So Jesus asks the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And they're all silent because they don't know what to say. They want to say no because they're trying to follow the letter of the law, but they feel like that's the wrong answer. So Jesus presses the point. If your child or your ox falls into a well, wouldn't you pull them out on the Sabbath? The Pharisees are missing the purpose of the law by their strict adherence to the letter of the law. The Sabbath was given as a gift to humanity, and one of its purposes was to help Israel love their neighbors better, as I talked about in a recent video. Next, Jesus sees the guests choosing places of honor at the table. So he gives a series of teachings that challenge societal norms around honor and social hierarchy. Jesus tells them that instead of taking the places of honor at the table, they should take the lowest place. Then there's the opportunity for their host to invite them to move up. This teaching is summarized by the phrase, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. This idea is extremely countercultural in a society where social settings are heavily shaped by honor. Choosing the humble place means relinquishing your social status and honor. After that, he tells the one who invited him, when you have a banquet, don't invite your friends or your rich neighbors who can pay you back but invite the poor and the crippled who can't pay you back. Then you will be repaid at the resurrection. This is another countercultural idea, but Jesus is telling people to forego the competition for status in the social hierarchy. Instead, use your resources to throw a banquet for those who don't boost your social standing. Finally, Jesus tells the parable of the great banquet. As all the invited guests are summoned to the banquet, one by one, they give excuses to explain why they can't come. And so the master of the house throwing the banquet gets angry, and he tells his servant to instead fill the house with the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, and to let them feast at the banquet. Again, those without resources are invited to a feast that they could never throw for themselves and could never pay back. 
In each of these interactions, Jesus is teaching his fellow dinner guests about the hospitality of the kingdom of God. He's teaching them about how to be a good guest and a good host at a banquet, but it's also about much more than that. Meals are a window into relationships, and Jesus is challenging them to exit the competition for honor and instead choose the way of humility. Norman Wurzba has coined the phrase Eucharistic table manners to describe the way that the Lord's Supper shapes the way that we eat during the rest of the week and in turn, the way that we live the rest of our lives. Wurzba says that the Eucharist is a ritual act that has the potential to transform eating in general so that it becomes hospitable at its core and leads to a communion of life. When we're shaped by the hospitality of the God who has brought us near, we start to demonstrate the kind of hospitality described here by Jesus. What Jesus gives here is a picture of how hospitality can heal a world dismembered by sin. Consider how the Eucharist can shape the way that you eat this week. And if you found value in this, click the like button and maybe check out this video linked on screen.